you will, go ahead and open your Bibles to number 800 and uh, Bibles, your song book. I, mean, I corrected it though, but I saw smiles and so uh, song book to number 850. Brother Matthew's going to lead us in that. And then after that, Ricky, would you word our prayer for us, please? Press it right. If you will go ahead and open your Bibles now to Proverbs chapter. Verse 9, for some reason I'm not picking up on, maybe it'll do right now. Chapter 29 and verse 9, and we're going to begin studying uh, this section of Scripture. And um, Solomon says, if a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. Now, uh, let me go back to what we were discussing when we ended our class last week. When you get to chapter 29, Solomon is focusing a lot of his message toward his son Rehoboam and how he would rule in his kingdom. And uh, when I look at this section here, and he's talking about a wise man, and he's talking about a foolish man, there's a contrast between them. And the wise man, it says, contends with a foolish man. Do you know what the word contends means? What's that? Strive? Wrestle? This is a legal word. It's a legal word. And uh, for a person who goes to a court with someone, and uh, if you go to court with a foolish man, how's it going to turn out? <laughs> Notice now whether the fool rages or laughs. Now, what, what's the difference between that? Okay. Uh, think about it for just a moment. If he rages, what is it? He's, he's mad. He lost. In other words, you contended with him and you got the better of him. Or he laughs. What's that indicate? 
He won and you lost. And he says, whether he rages or laughs, there's still what? No peace. What is that trying to tell you? Somebody loses. But let me ask you, if you decide you're going to have to wrestle with an alligator and you say, well, I either I won or he won, you're still going to come out hurt, aren't you? You're still going to come out with bruises and bites and gashes and stuff like that. Even if, even if you are able to slay the alligator, it's still, well, let me ask you maybe something a little less. If you get into a battle with a skunk, whether you win or he wins, you're still going to stink. Does that make it a little easier to understand? If you contend with a foolish man, what's it going to do? There's not going to be any peace from it. You're not going to have any resolution. Now, have you ever heard sometimes it's just not worth it? Uh, sometimes a person wants to argue what's the best thing to do. Walk away. And some things are just very difficult to find a peaceful solution for. Well, let me offer you some passages which I think will be helpful. If you go back to chapter 26 and verse 4, he says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. You don't want to get involved in doing the same things he does. Uh, it's easy when you're arguing with somebody to want to get on their level. But if you're arguing with a foolish man, you get on his level, what have you become? You become a fool as well. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 13, Solomon also writes, The words of the mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is ravening madness. You've got to sometimes let Solomon's words sink in before you really appreciate what he's saying. It says, the words of his mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is ravening madness. Uh, when you're dealing with a foolish person, there's not a lot of wiggle room to accomplish any good. And sometimes the best thing to do is say, I can't do any good here. You remember what Jesus did with, told the disciples to do when he sent them out on a limited commission? He said, if a person will not hear you, Shake the dust off your feet and go on. Uh, occasionally, I've knocked doors, and when I've encountered somebody at the door, and they were already angry and frustrated, and what's the best thing to do? Have a nice day. And uh, I remember knocking doors up in the edge of uh, Indiana when we had a mission effort we helped up in Carrollton, Kentucky. I knocked doors for a little while up in Indiana. And while I was doing that, I had a man who was on the back side of the river there, went to his house, and uh, he wasn't very happy when he came to the door, and he was very hostile. And when I told him, uh, I walked away, I said, well, just have a nice day. He said, are you trying to tell me what to do? <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, how do you respond to that? So I just kept my mouth shut and walked on the way off. Plus, he had two huge dogs. That, uh, but uh, next passage, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 16. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. A wise man fears and departs from evil. You know, you recognize something that's going to be what it is, and you just walk away from it. But the fool just keeps on raging. But if you don't argue with him, do you have an argument? No. And I, I think there's value in what Solomon is trying to say here. Okay, verse 10. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless, but the upright seek his well-being. Now, um, let's look at the people he's talking about first of all. You've got the bloodthirsty, and then you've got the upright, and... Of course, the upright's also called blameless. Now, what does the bloodthirsty do? 
He hates the blameless. And if you call a man bloodthirsty, what does that mean? Wicked? Okay. Well, break the word down. What's the first half of the word? Blood. What does that indicate? He's wanting to kill you. In other words, he's, you know, his attitude is, I'm going to take your life. And uh, he's bloodthirsty. He's looking for someone to engage him. Uh, <laughs> Cain and Abel, really good example of that. Uh, you find people who are willing to physically harm somebody else, and it says the bloodthirsty hates the blameless. Now, what that tells me about the wicked people is many of them not only hate somebody enough, but they hate them enough to kill them. Uh, are there people like that today whose hate is so deep and so strong that they would uh, be willing to kill somebody? Oh, yeah, you see that uh, a lot of other nations, but you're starting to see it in our country as well, that people's hatred is so strong that they're willing to kill somebody because of it. But in contrast to that, the upright seek his well-being. Do, would you say that our country right now is all peaceful and calm, or would you say that we are more or less at odds and divided? We are a nation divided. Uh, we're divided over a lot of things, but uh, it appears that there's a, a desire to, by many people, to want to follow God's plans and follow his will, and there's a desire on other parts to be able to have any kind of lifestyle they want to live, and it appears there's a lot of people who are bloodthirsty over this. How am I going to respond to somebody who is evil toward me? That's exactly what the latter part of Romans 12 is about. How do you overcome evil? With good. And uh, you do good to those who hate you. You pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It's what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. So uh, there's a, a very strong emphasis here that the good people are not bloodthirsty. You don't seek revenge. You don't seek to harm someone else. You seek to treat them good even to those who hate you. And David said in Psalms chapter 37 and verse 14, he said, the wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy, to slay those who are of an upright conduct. And then in chapter 38 and verse 12 of Psalms, he says, those who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. Uh, there are people who are trying to undermine us. And what's Solomon trying to say to Rehoboam here? Take the high road. Be better. Treat people who hate you good. Uh, that's something that's sort of hard for people to appreciate today is, is trying to treat other people good regardless of how they treat you. And... Uh, it's easy to let the world put you in its mold and say, I'll return evil for evil. We don't say that today. We say, I'll give them a taste of their own medicine. In other words, we're going to let them know how we feel. Well, now you go back to verse 9, and what does that verse say? If you contend with a foolish man where the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. What is he trying to say in verses 9 and 10? better to walk away sometimes it's better to avoid conflict it's better and uh, that's just not what we normally want to do okay let's go to verse 11 because it also ties together a fool vents all his feelings but a wise man holds them back now you're talking about the difference between a fool and a wise man what does a fool do? He vents. What does the word vent mean? 
He lets it out. Uh, it's almost like you have a, a fireplace and you've got a chimney that draws the smoke out. And it's considered to be a vent. That's the way it, it vents all of that. Well, it says a fool vents all his feelings. What does that mean? It lets them out. Okay. Talks way too much. Well, if I'm talking about feelings, has anybody ever made you mad just like that? And then 30 minutes later, you realize, why in the world did I get mad at that? They were really telling me the truth. Somebody who maybe says something or doesn't. Let me ask you, husbands and wives, have any of you ever responded quickly and wished that you hadn't? <laughs> I was hoping nobody would say anything. <laughs> uh, the fool says what's ever on his mind, whatever, how he feels at the moment, and he doesn't think about because, see, a fool never considers the consequences. He never thinks about how this is going to be interpreted, how it's going to come back on him, how other people are going to take it. He just says, okay, here it is. Take it as it comes. But a wise man holds him back because he, he realizes, you know, I may not mean what I'm saying right now. I may wish later I hadn't said that. How can you unsay something? You can't. Uh, to illustrate it, one guy used an illustration. He says, uh, I, I want to acknowledge I've been telling gossip, and I shouldn't have, and I, I'm sorry for that, and I want to make it right. So, well, let me tell you what to do. Go take a pillow, and I want you to take all the feathers and just scatter them everywhere you can. He says, all right, I'll do that. So he comes back, and he says, now what I need to do? He said, go get them all back. You can't do it. Well, you can't call back words either. After they're said, sometimes what you have said has such a negative impact on other people. They've already decided how they think about you. The wise man holds them back. Well, let's go to some passages that are parallels here. Yeah. You know the old phrase, the parable we use today, or proverb today, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, if you would avoid saying something before you said it, then you'd be much better off. But see, the foolish never thinks about that. No, because they're not sure that that's how you were actually feeling when you said it. They know that's how you were feeling. And it amazes me, some of the TV stars and the politicians get up and uh, they apologize for what they said. And it makes me think of a little child when you've got two of them fussing and fighting and said, all right, tell them you're sorry. I'm sorry. You know they don't mean it. And I see some of these politicians and they say, I'm sorry for what I said. Like, you know, well, that's the reason why some people don't accept apologies is because they're not certain the person who said it's genuine. Let's look at some parallels here. Chapter 15 and verse 28 says, The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. The wise man says, okay, now what am I going to say? Uh, if I am all the time not listening and I'm just ready to pop out just as soon as they take a breath, and I'm ready to pop out what I want to say, then I've not really shown my wisdom there. In chapter 29 and verse 20, he said, Even a fool is counted wise, or excuse me, do you see a man hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. A man who's hasty in his words, he's just talking too much, too fast. Now, chapter 17 and verse 28, which is what I was fixing to quote, Even a fool is considered wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perceptive. Uh, when he doesn't talk, well, maybe he's learning something. Maybe it's making something to him. And then in chapter 10 and verse 19, 
He said, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10 and verse 14 says, also, a fool also multiplies words. No man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? Uh, the more he talks, you don't even know what he's saying after a while. Well, I think the key New Testament passage that helps us, James chapter 1, verse 19. But let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Now, why slow to speak and slow to wrath? Why are they going together? What happens when a man loses his temper? That's when he says something that just pops out of his mouth. That's a fool who gives vent to all of his feelings is a man who loses his temper and then he's saying things he shouldn't be saying. Uh, and you may see a man use profane language. You may see him uh, make promises he knows he's not going to keep. Uh, those are bad things that are part of a person who gives vent to all of his feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We'd be much better off if we just didn't talk. Uh, and I found myself occasionally uh, wanting to say something. And uh, Credit used to, I remember we went visiting one time and the, the class teacher was saying some things I didn't agree with. And she, she just touched me. She said, shh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's great value in that. There's great value in that. Wives are really good when they touch your leg and say, shh. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go to verse 12. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. That's one of the ones that you think about a little longer and you start seeing more and more and more application to it. If a ruler, who do you think he's got in mind? Rehoboam, Rehoboam, if a ruler pays attention to lies, well, if it's a lie, do you, there's at least a little bit of thought here. If somebody tells you something, do you think you ought to verify whether it's true or not? How would you do that? You remember what, Solomon, in the multitude of counselors, there is... Safety. In other words, if you go ask somebody, what do you think about this? Oh, they may tell you the truth. They may not. You go over here, and what happens if a ruler surrounds himself with yes men? He becomes corrupt. Because if they're yes men, what are they telling him? What they think he wants to hear. What if it's true, and what if it's false? Doesn't matter. If a ruler pays attention to lies, in other words, he just listens to what everybody tells him, who's, who are, he's surrounded himself with yes men, and they're always going to tell him exactly what he wants to hear. Um, and there were kings who were like that. Uh, so it says his servants will become corrupt. That is, his ministers, those who serve under him. They know what the boss wants to hear, and so they're going to tell him, and they have no respect for the truth. So the fault here lies, first of all, with a ruler. Because a good ruler will do what? He'll surround himself with what kind of people? Good people, but what do good people do? They're honest. They're going to tell you the truth. They will tell you, that's not a good decision. That's not wise. Uh, people are not going to respond well to that. Well, the second fault lies with those who are the servants because what they have done, they have surrendered their integrity, the truth, for popularity with the king. And uh, so these people are secondarily false because they're the ones who tell the lies. And why do they tell them? Because it curries favor with the king. Well, let me go back to some passages which I think can be helpful here. In chapter 20 and verse 8, a king who sits on the throne of judgment 
scatters all evil with his lies. The good king who sits on the throne of justice is not going to tolerate lies. You got to tell me the truth. I may not like what you got to say, but you got to tell me the truth. Uh, let's say a, a king's getting ready to go out to war and he calls his generals in before him and says, all right, uh, generals, should we go out and go to battle against this other nation? Can we win this battle? What if they lie to him? Okay, he may lose his kingdom because of that. He may, because he knows they want to say, oh, we're always going to win, we're always going to win. No, you may not always win. I need you to tell me the truth and always tell me the truth. In chapter 14 and verse 35, he said, The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. He's just against him. And then one more, the book of Psalms, chapter 101 and verse 7. He who works deceit shall not dwell in my house. He who tells lies will not continue in my presence. That's David. And what he's saying is, if you're going to work deceit, you're going to try to shade it for me. I'm telling you, no, you're not going to stay here. You're not going to be a part of my presence. I'll run you from me. Anybody else? Well, if he pays it. Yeah. I think what he's talking about is their eventuality. If, if he pays attention to lies, everybody's going to eventually lie to him, you know, where, just to curry his favor because that's all he wants to hear is, is really the primary obligation is on the ruler here is what he's doing and the way he's, the way he's making his servants. He's creating an administration that does what he wants them to do. So like Abraham did when he called Sarah his sister, which was technically correct, but it's it's deceit, and once you have it at the head of the stream, what happens to it? It keeps going. Okay, let's go to verse thirteen. The poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. Now, uh, this is one that, it, again, takes a little bit of time to contemplate or think about. He talks about the poor man and the oppressor. Now, these are the opposite ends of the spectrum. Because what is a, when you think about a poor man and you think about an oppressor, what does the oppressor do? Who does he oppress? The poor man. And they're both on each ends of the spectrum. One is the oppressed and the other is the oppressor. And uh, if you're looking at uh, the Septuagint, which I, I try to compare things, the Septuagint uses the word debtor and the word creditor. Sorry, I can't write real well today. Uh, but the debtor and the creditor. Now, that, that helps me see it maybe in a little clearer way because the debtor and the creditor have this in common. Well, what is it they have in common? The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. Now, both are the recipients of God's blessings, whether you're a creditor or a debtor or you're an oppressor or you're a poor man. If you'll remember in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 44 and 45, part of Jesus' sermon, 
He said, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who uh, pray for and hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Do the bad people get the blessings of God? Yeah. They breathe God's air. They enjoy the uh, rain that falls. And he's trying to say there's a commonality of manhood. If you go back to chapter 22 of verse, uh, Proverbs and verse 2, he said, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Uh, God is the creator of good people and bad people, and uh, they're all a part of his creation, and God cares for all. Because sometimes some of the bad people become what? They become good people. They're the ones who actually become righteous and holy. Uh, well, there's some more commonalities that Solomon observed in the book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes... Um, let's see if I can put this at the top up here. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 14, he says, There's a vanity which occurs in the earth, that there is just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. And again, there are wicked men whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said, this also is vanity. And then in chapter 9 and in verse uh, 2 and 3, he says, all things alike come to all. One event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As to the good, so is to the sinner. He who takes an oath and he who fears an oath, this evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. After that, they go to the dead. What one thing happens to the good and the bad? Everybody dies. So Solomon here in Ecclesiastes, or excuse me, Proverbs 29 and verse 13, is talking about what the Lord does, and he gives light to the eyes of both. What does it mean to give light to the eyes? Both of them can see. But in this case, what are they seeing? Same thing. Well, Psalms chapter nine, yeah, 19 and verse 8. It says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. Has God spoken to both the good and the evil? to the poor and to the oppressor? Yes. And uh, so I, what I'm stepping back and trying to put this in the context is to say to Rehoboam, you know what? Whether you are righteous or whether you're wicked, whether you're the creditor or you're the debtor, whether you're the rich man or whether you're the poor man, God has given instructions to everybody. And we sometimes don't think of it in that way. We tend to think God's law is for somebody else, but not for me. And uh, I think that is what is behind this passage. Okay, let's go to verse 14. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. Now he's talked about a ruler. Now is he talking about the king. That's going to tell me he's trying to focus on his son with expectation you're going to be in the position where I am and how are you going to treat people who are poor? What does that mean? Sure. I want to go back two verses to verse 12. If a ruler pays attention to lies, 
all his servants will become wicked. Go back now to verse 14. The king who judges the poor with truth, his strong throne will be established forever. What do you think the, the connection would be between verse 12 and verse 14? The lies versus the truth. When it comes to a poor man, how are you going to respond to him? Are you going to let somebody else tell you how you ought to treat him? Or are you going to ascertain the facts yourself? Are you going to say, I'm going to treat this man fairly and honestly? He may not be able to have all of the assets that the oppressor has. And now when I take that with verse 13, where he talks about going back here, the poor man and the oppressor have this in common. Here they are, both of them are in your court. You're the king, you're making the decision. Here's an oppressor who probably has plenty of money, who probably has a lot of clout and influence, and you have a poor man over here. Now, what are you going to do? The king who judges the poor with truth. He lets that be his guide, that be his decision making. His throne will be established for the ever. Uh, I just think there's a strong indication here that people ought to think about how they treat other people. And uh, if you go to a couple of other passages, chapter 17 and verse 23, he said, a wicked man accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the way of justice. And in chapter 29 and verse 4, earlier in this chapter, it says, the king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. If you got your oppressor on this side, you got the poor man over here, what's the oppressor going to say? Let me give you some money and you decide in my favor. And here's the poor man, and here's the guy over here has got money. He can get something that's the justice due to that poor man. Let's say a poor man owns an acre of ground and this rich man wants it. And he says, I want that piece of ground over there. And he doesn't want to sell it to me. And uh, if you will get, condemn it and give it to me, I'll give you a little bit on the side. That's not justice. That's not fair. And that's not the way we want rulers of our country to judge us and to rule us. Okay, let's get to verse 15. This is one of the verses I'm going to leave a little bit of time for. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. First thing that you'll notice here, the rod and rebuke. What does that mean? There's both the verbal and physical discipline. The rod is the physical discipline. And Solomon has talked about that a lot. Going back to chapter 23, and if you go to verses 13 and 14, he says, uh, Do not withhold correction from your child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Uh, in chapter 22 and verse 15, he said, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. My parents believe this. <laughs> I would say some of your parents believe this. Some of you believe this. Physical discipline is the only way you can teach some people. And some children have to have an attitude adjustment. And the way you adjust their attitude is with some physical correction. Now, I know that's not popular today. I know that's not current psychological thinking. But these psychologists, if you look at their families and their lives, then you'd say, why are we letting these people write books to tell us how to raise our children when they have no clue what they're doing whatsoever? You better read God's Word, which tells you the truth. But the second part of it, he says, the rod and rebuke. There's some people who think physical discipline is the only way to handle things. It's not. What does rebuke have to do with it? Okay. Okay. 
Okay? If you don't have verbal teaching goes along with it, then they don't know anything other than the fact that you, you're just being mean to me. Now, you're probably going to, as a child, think that anyway. But later on, you'll come back and you'll say, they did that for my good. Uh, you know, what, what if we acted like some of our children? Some people do. You saw that they had no correction. Well, there's some good teaching to go along with this. In Proverbs chapter 15, in verses 31 and 32, he says, The ear that hears the rebuke will, of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains in destruct, dis, uh, instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. Um, he's talking about a person who listens to rebuke, who listens to it. And then there's one other really good one. It's chapter 17 and verse 10. He said, rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. If you rebuke a wise man, what's he going to do? He's going to make changes to it. But sometimes it, for a fool, it takes a tremendous amount. Now, there's a New Testament passage which I think is very important found in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. You probably can quote it. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture them or bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Now, the word training and admonition is exactly the same idea as rod and rebuke. Training there refers to the corporeal punishment. The uh, instruction there refers to the verbal teaching. So you got both of them. They work together in trying to rear children. And I would say most of us, as our children are young, we try to teach them, and as they get a little wisdom and they start realizing mama and daddy mean what they say, then it becomes more verbal, does it not? As children get older, is it not more verbal then? Uh, and it's, it's much easier to have a, a mild physical discipline when a child is young and try to wait till they're older and then you're not capable of, of disciplining them in a reasonable way. And uh, what you end up with is you've raised a fool that you have to have the blows for them to be able to teach them anything. Anybody have any observations or comments on this? Okay, let's go to verse 16. That's probably all we'll have time to cover today. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. What Solomon is saying is good is going to win in the end. The righteous people are going to see their fall. So you're, again, you're talking about the two categories, the wicked and the righteous. But when the wicked are multiplied, what does that mean? Okay. More and more people become wicked. Uh, would you say right now that in the country as a whole, that there are more wicked or more righteous people? Now, this is just a, a, an estimation on your part, not a... Some say more wicked, some more righteous. Now, I would say in our local community here, how would you say it would be? I'd say they're more righteous. But I would say in our country as a whole, it's probably more wicked. Uh, you know, I don't have any true statistics to verify that, but... When the wicked are multiplied, what happens? Transgression increases. That means that you have more and more sin, violation of God's law, happening anywhere and everywhere. Uh, lawlessness prevails. Uh, you know, you see what's happening in a lot of places today. Uh, people go in and they destroy buildings. Uh, I've noticed out west where they're cho choosing not to prosecute criminals anymore. And you tell people, oh, yeah, by the way, if you go and uh, take the store and you go and break the door down and you walk out with all the merchandise, oh, yeah, we're not going to prosecute you for that. Guess what happens? It increases. You know, it just it goes, multiplies. 
But he's telling you the righteous will see their fall. They'll see how this works out in the end. This is very similar to what he said back in verse 2 when he said, when a righteous and authority, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Uh, there's several other passages, but uh, we're going to have to pick up with verse 17, Lord willing, next Sunday.